Okay, I'm going to be a little bit longer than uh, the Colonel's presentation because we had a lot of uh, work to kind of relay to you today, and I see some familiar faces from the workshop we had earlier today. Uh, again, my name is Matt DeWolf. I'm the Canadian co-chair of the study board. Uh, the study board is in full attendance here. I think we're missing one technical working group member. So I see Bill anywhere. Uh, so we're, we're charged with basically reviewing the 2,000 rokers. So I'll just jump right in here and, and kind of review what our mandate is. So the current rokers, I'm assuming everyone here is, is familiar with what the rokers are, they were established in 2000 after a, a pretty thorough review through the 90s over, uh, I think, more than five years. Uh, and they replaced the 1970 rokers, and there's just a picture here of the Namek and Lake rokers. The 2000 are in blue, and the 1970 rokers in the bold black lines. And the, the main changes from the previous rule curve set that was established in 1970 were on Namekin Lake, very little change on Rainy Lake. And the change was mostly in the, over the winter, there's much less drawdown. So this is several feet cut off in terms of how far the lake would be drawn down over the winter. An earlier refill compared to the 1970 rule curves. And so at the start of June, you're at the top of the uh, target elevation range for the year, and then a gradual drawdown through the summer and the fall are the chief differences from the 2000 rule curves. And those changes were primarily aimed at improving navigation conditions on uh, Namekin Lake in the early spring, and also improving a lot of ecological uh, outcomes. So uh, spawning areas, things like that. The over summer drawdown, the principal uh, idea behind that is to create different levels of water levels for the summer, so as wind uh, moves at different water level elevations, you're cleaning off substrate that can be used for spawning the next year, so it's kind of like a washing procedure through the summer. When the rule curves were established in 2000, the IJC required in the order that made them official that the uh, control board or whoever would be reviewing this, the uh, rule curves in 15 years. And in that 15 year period, they also started a plan of study to actually start a bunch of scientific investigations to look at how different uh, things in the ecosystem, uh, tourism, power production, whatnot, might be affected by the implementation of the 2000 rule curves. So ultimately, they want to know, did the 2000 rule curves do what they were expected to do? Did they have unintended consequences? And that's part of what we're talking about here today. So the, the study board that we're here with today uh, was appointed in September 2015, and we're due to report on our findings uh, this spring. So our terms of reference and our directive, they're fairly long, but to boil it all down, we've got two main aims. The first was to answer that question. Did the 2000 rule curves perform as expected? And the approach that we use here is uh, referred to as a weight of evidence analysis. Uh, so where possible, we rely on actual data from the field to compare a, a pre-2000 rule curves to post-2000 rule curves to see if a particular study subject has changed, whether it's a a spawning success for certain species or wild rice or whatever the particular uh, interest is, you know, tourism. Uh, there's a whole variety we'll get into in a bit here. And where there isn't sufficient data for that to try to uh, use modeling to kind of answer that question, and in some cases to use modeling to kind of figure out, yes, there has been a change since 2000 in a particular interest, but was it really due to the change in the in the water level targets, or was there something else at play? So where possible, we wanted to make sure that if we did see a change, it was due to the, the change in the rule curves and not due to, say, uh, having a number of really wet uh, springs since 2000 that we didn't really see in the 80s and early 90s. So we reviewed a whole slew of studies that were involved with this and a whole bunch of uh, monitoring data that was provided by the resource agencies, for, particularly for uh, fish and uh, wildlife and vegetation. And uh, we presented our preliminary results of this analysis in July, uh, our draft re uh, results in November, and we finalized uh, this uh, table I'm going to show you in a moment uh, within the last month. So, and the final point there that we reviewed our interpretation of all these studies with the actual report authors to make sure that we, you know, not always being subject matter experts in a lot of these fields, are, we're interpreting the science correctly. So this is what the table looks like, and I'm not intending for anyone to actually read it here, but basically it breaks it down. You've got all the different study subjects. The first category here is a variety of different fish uh, studies, then wildlife, economic impacts, archeological resources, vegetation, 
uh, in the vertebrates. And then we have Mammoth Reservoir here, Rainy Lake, and some subjects were also studied on Rainy River. And we just went through with each study and decided, de answered the question, did the regulation of the lakes under the 2000 rule curves result in a better, a neutral, or a worse outcome for that particular study subject? And then each of these columns, this is better, neutral, worse, or if there wasn't enough evidence that the curve you know, didn't fall into one of those categories, we said it was inconclusive. So the, the point of putting all this in the table is that you can kind of see where things are falling out. So in general, most of the changes we were expecting to see were on Namakin Lake, and most of the changes we were anticipating, or the IJC were, was anticipating when uh, these were put into place in 2000, were for improved outcomes in some areas, but they were also anticipating some uh, negative outcomes in terms of power production and slightly higher uh, flooding on Rainy Lake. So those were the, the trade-offs that they uh, accepted with the 2,000 workers. So in conclusion for that part of the study, uh, the study board views that overall the 2,000 world curves have performed as expected. There are some minor inconsistencies with what had been anticipated, but on the whole, the 2,000 world curves uh, did what they were supposed to do. <coughs> which, <coughs> excuse me, which brings us to the second aim, which is, okay, so the 2,000 world curves did pretty well, or at least did what the IJC had hoped they would do. Is there a way that we can improve upon the performance of these rule curves in the future by making changes to the rule curves? And so I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about uh, that. And the approach that we use for this uh, second goal is called a shared vision planning analysis. This is a, a whole approach to uh, this type of problem solving that's been used in other watersheds that the International Joint Commission's been involved with, like in the Great Lakes. And uh, the idea behind it is that it's a, a transparent and open process. So all the modeling and everything that we, we have is open to uh, the public and open to, uh, we have a, a public advisory group, so over 30 members representing different areas of the watershed and different interests that are involved directly with the, the study board, as well as a resource advisory group. So these are agency resource experts that can help to advise us on, uh, on the modeling and the studies that we're looking at. And at the heart of the approach are these computer models. Uh, there's two that we use. One is called the shared vision model, and another which is called the integrated environment response model. And uh, I'm not going to get too deep into how those work here today. You might have heard at a, a previous presentation how they work. But essentially, we rely on this model data that is supported by all these other studies that have gone on to the aim is to allow us to develop alternatives to the 2,000 rule curves, and then in a model, try to figure out, well, how well do those perform if we make this tweak in the rule curve? How does that affect walleye spawning on Namakin Reservoir? How does it affect power production on Rainy Lake? How does it affect flooding on both lakes? So the model allows us to test all the assumptions and theories and work through a bunch of different alternatives. Uh, so in terms of developing alternatives, I'm just going to go through uh, the, the areas where we sought to make you know, possible changes. So I mentioned that with the adoption of the 2000 rule curves, it was understood that there'd be slightly higher flood peaks in some years on Rainy Lake when you, you do have flooding. So that was one area we'd hope to uh, reduce that flooding, maybe back to the, the levels that you would have seen if the 1970 rule curves were in place. And the second category covers a, a number of sub-subjects, but basically ecological subjects of concern that weren't addressed by the 2000 rule curves or that could be further improved upon. And these include uh, muskrat winter survival, uh, northern pike spawning habitat, wild rice. Uh, since the 90s, the spread of invasive cattail, particularly in Rainy Lake, is becoming an issue. And that's one area we looked at. And the last category there is uh, interannual variability. And um, that will come up a couple more times after I after this slide, so I'll just explain what that means. Under rule curve operations, as long as water isn't flowing in too uh, fast or too slow, if it's not too wet or too dry, the operators can do a pretty good job of keeping the lake right within that rule curve year round, year after year after year, which is great because you're, you're meeting the regulation, you're in where the rule curve target is, but from the ecosystem's perspective, that's really an unnatural kind of state to be in. If you have exactly the same levels every summer, every winter, every fall, you're not really resembling a, a more natural system. And uh, you know, certainly lots of the 
the study work that Jean Marin, our ecological modeling expert here, has, has shown is that uh, increased variability, so more highs and more lows within the system, really improves a lot of ecological uh, outcomes in the system. So this is just going to be a uh, schematic for how we go about developing the alternatives that I'm going to show you later. So the first is to identify the area for improvement, and those were the areas I just showed. And the second is then to take one of those areas and develop a draft rule curve that you might explore. And then to model the performance of that alternative within the shared vision model. You get the results coming out of that model, and you need to look at those results and say, okay, how did this uh, perform? Did we get the result we were hoping to see by making this change? And what are the trade-offs for all the other interests uh, that we're modeling? And if the answer is yes, the results were good, and we can accept the trade-offs, and this becomes a viable option for us to discuss as part of the, these workshops that we have with the public advisory group and the resource agency groups. However, if the answer is no, we have to make a decision as a study board, should we be pursuing this any further? Is this result just so crazy that no one's ever gonna accept it? And if the answer is no, it's not worth pursuing further, then we abandon that and look to something else. But if the answer is yes, it just means we need to go back and refine how we're changing that curve and try to adjust things so we can accept the trade-offs a little better, then it's back into the same cycle, retesting and redoing. So our technical working group has done a tremendous amount of work testing various permutations of the rule curves and, and has helped us narrow down to some practical options here, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. So moving on to the flooding uh, example, the way that uh, this proceeded over the last few months, uh, Bill Warrick, who's our chair vision modeling expert, tested originally some examples of, well, his assumptions were, let's say we can always predict exactly when you're gonna have a flood every year, bang on 100%. And let's say we open the, the gates and the, the log sluices at Mammakin uh, wide open in January every year which is, of course, completely unrealistic and impractical. But the purpose of that exercise was to see how much flood reduction can you get in those flood years if you had that really extreme reaction. And uh, you do get you know, significantly different from, say, operation under the 2000 rule curves, but it doesn't prevent any, the flooding from happening altogether. It, it cuts off some of the, the peaks, but the trouble is you get the lake depth levels down so low in the winter that they're so low they can't pass the water when the, uh, the main flood wave comes through and, and the lake level just rises out of control. So it would be lower. The point of that exercise was to kind of set our expectations. We know we can't really do any better than that in terms of flood reduction. And that's unrealistic. We're not gonna open the dams fully in the middle of the winter and wreck all the ice and send water down the rainy river. But it's an important exercise to understand what our limitations are in terms of uh, flooding. So the next, uh, step after that was to try to come up with some realistic plans for how we might try to uh, reduce the flood, particularly on Rainy Lake. So we tested here some targets, lower targets, either on Rainy Lake or Rainy and Namakin, but not going back to the 1970 rule curves on Namakin. We feel, uh, I think as a study board, that the 2000 rule curves are worth uh, maintaining on, on Namakin Lake. So the primary focus is how to reduce flooding on rainy by changing the rule curve on rainy. We also looked at not just lower targets, but delaying when you start to refill the lakes, if you can, on either rainy or both rainy and namakin. And one other aspect that's been raised is the, the fact that you get up in the rule curve on namakin at the start of June and immediately start drawing it down, so you're passing more water into rainy lake. So whether uh, holding that flat like it was in the 1970 rule curves would provide any flood relief on rainy. So this curve here, the black dashed line is the 2000 rule curve for Rainy Lake. And the red curve is what we've eventually narrowed down to as uh, what we've called a flood reduction curve. So you can see this is uh, the, the calendar along the bottom here. You're coming down through the winter, the start of April, instead of starting to refill the lake, you hold the lake level flat at the low point of the rule curve, and you delay the refill until the start of May. The hope here is that you do have your fresh out starting in April, and you're passing that water instead of storing it and using it to refill the lake to make room for what you expect to be a very wet spring if you're expecting lots of rainfall. 
when we test it on Namekin Lake, it's a bit of a, a different situation because the Namekin curve actually does extend well into May at the bottom here, so you can hug it low, but the target range here in red is the lower half of that curve, but then delaying the refill uh, slightly as you get into the wettest part of the year up until uh, the middle of June. So there are some risks with this approach. Uh, the 2000 rule curves intentionally don't go that low because you want water levels to be at a certain height for spawning, for example, uh, around ice out when the freshet is starting. So we do harden some interests, and you also risk, if you end up getting a dry spring, not getting the lakes back up because you've gone down so low. To reduce these risks, so the idea isn't that we would do this every year, but you would do it when you really expect there's going to be a big flood. And uh, historically, the control board or whoever's been involved hasn't been able to find a good statistical way to predict when you're going to have a big flood year. You could have a heavy snowpack, you don't get the rain in the spring, you don't have a flood, and vice versa, it can be true. You can have a, a pretty mild winter, but get a heavy uh, rainfall and have a flood. So we spent a lot of time in this study looking at ways to better uh, come up with indicators that you have a high potential of flooding, and that's when you would use this lower rule curve uh, option. So in all of our, our modeling that I'm gonna be talking about here, that's what the model does. It looks to see whether these indicators which rely to some degree on snowpack, but also on uh, sort of La Nina and El Nino. We found that there's actually a, some connection between what's happening in the Pacific Ocean and, and temperatures and the weather patterns that, that affects in North America and the flood risk in the spring here. So we have a built-in indicator in the model that will say flood yes or flood no. And if it's flood yes, then you go ahead and uh, keep the lake lower in the spring than the lake. And when we do that, just in terms of testing whether we're, we're accurate about uh, whether there's going to be a flood or not, when you apply this type of test uh, to all the years back from 1950 to 2015, the results are that roughly 80% of the time you correctly predict when you're going to have a flood, so you're making the correct decision to keep the lake lower. 20% of the time you miss that flood. And the reverse, we correctly predict about 76% of the time that there's not going to be a flood. And uh, so those rates are, are fairly good in terms of making that uh, call. <clears throat> so we go through this process again and uh, we get down to evaluating the results. And within the model itself, for all these different rule curves that we're evaluating, it will come up with results for all of these different indicators. So we've got flood damage, uh, boating depths on Rainy Lake, archaeological sites which can be really damaged by stable water levels that, uh, as uh, Bill Warwick was saying earlier today, just tend to erase the sites because you're, you're getting wind and wave action at the same elevation all the time. Uh, power production and then a whole slew of uh, fish, wildlife, and uh, vegetation subjects here. And this is what the output looks like when you're actually looking at the model. I'm not going to get into the details here. But Bill has kindly color-coded all of this, so each of these columns is a different rule curve option that he presented today uh, for the study board to consider. And each of the lines across is one of these study subjects that we can assign a number to, to how well it performs. And the, the more red the color is, the worse it performs in that category. And the more blue, the better it performs. And uh, this column here is the 2000 rule curves, which is kind of our base comparison that we compare everything to. And column B is the uh, flood reduction curve I was just showing you. The top here is the flood reduction uh, in terms of dollars. So we have a model that will, for every centimeter that you're moving up in terms of a flood, it'll assign a, a, a dollar value to how much damage that's causing around the lake. And what we see here is that there's a considerable savings in terms of overall uh, flood risk reduction compared to the 2000 rule curves. And there's some drawbacks there. You, you don't do as well in terms of fighting off cattail. And uh, there are some concerns over walleye here. The scores are a little bit lower than the 2000 rule curves. And this slide just summarizes what I just said. So most years uh, were, were close to the flood damage that you would have had under the 1970 rule curves. But the, the benefit of this is that you're only using this in, when you see that flood signal. 
and the rest of the year we have essentially the 2,000 rule curves, which we view as a pretty good rule curve. The cons here, somewhat lower walleye scores than under the 2,000 rule curves, and uh, raised this morning were some concerns over the downstream effects of passing that water early in the spring uh, more than you do now. Uh, Larry Kalaminer, former resident expert here, uh, raised concerns about the cold water plume going down the river that early in the spring, so effects on spawning downstream, and effects on water levels on the river and Lake of the Woods downstream that, that uh, should be considered there. Uh, this table is just to get away from the dollar amounts to give a sense of just how much is that flood reduction that we're talking about. So I'm going to take a moment just to explain what it's showing. So down this column here are the years that we've had floods in Rainy Lake in the basin. That's not exhaustive, but it's a lot of the big ones. So 1950, 2014, and all the years in between. The next column is how much lower, according to the model, the lake level would have been at the peak of the flood that year if the 1970 rule curves were in place compared to what the 2000 rule curves would have done. So obviously you get back in the 60s and the, and the 50s, there were different rule curves in place, but we can simulate what operation would have been like if, with any rule curves, so what the water levels would have been. So for example, in 1950, if you had the 2000 rule curves in place, you would have been four centimeters higher at your peak than if you had the 1970 rule curves in place. When we get down to more recent memory, you know, the 2014 flood, you would have been four centimeters lower on, uh, on Rainy Lake if the 1970 rule curves had been in place. We move over to the next column, and this is the flood reduction curve. So how well is it doing to try to make up some of that flood uh, protection that we had under the 1970 rule curves on Rainy Lake? Uh, 2014, you're getting the same reduction in, in the peak elevation on, on Rainy Lake by just holding the lake uh, that much lower on Rainy early in the spring. So this column here is just the difference between 70 and the flood reduction curve. So anywhere where it's zero is exactly the same as 1970. There are a few years, depending on when that water is moving through the system, that the 70 rule curve will do better. So you're looking at 2005 here, you're, you're almost three inches better on, if you'd had the 1970 rule curves in place. But there's also, you know, the case 1985 where you're two inches better doing this flood reduction approach as opposed to the 1970 rule curve. So on average, if you take all these years, you're pretty much the same in terms of flood reduction if you've done this new approach that we're suggesting or the 1970 rule curve. You get the same benefit uh, by doing this adaptive approach. So that's the flooding side of it and how we came up with that curve. And uh, we'll talk about the results a little bit more after. On the ecological side, I mentioned to some of these subjects here, so improving muskrat over winter survival. And uh, John can speak much more eloquently than I can about the, the benefits of having muskrat in the system. Muskrat do not do well in these lakes. Uh, the drawdown over the winter, they, they set up their lodges before ice in and the water drops and they're left exposed because they, they don't have the insulation of the water and they basically die off from freezing. In a more natural system, you don't get as much drawdown over the, over the system, so natural lakes in the area, you're gonna have more muskrats setting up shop. But muskrats, as John was explaining earlier today, really are the, you know, the engineers in the wetlands of the system and they, they provide a range of services, if you will, for a, a broader ecological uh, purpose that benefits fisheries, that benefit you know, resort industries, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're looking at muskrat here, we're not just talking about wanting to save a particular mammal in the system. It's a much broader uh, topic, which gets on to the next subject, which is uh, the invasive cattail in the system. Muskrats love cattails. So if you have a good, healthy muskrat population, you can uh, naturally combat to some degree the, the spread of the uh, cattails and maybe even uh, recoup some of the areas that they've taken over. Uh, we've looked at pike spawning grounds, so improving uh, pike spawning, which generally doesn't do well in these systems because they need lots of uh, high water early in the system and the rural curves don't provide that right now. And finally, again, improving that interannual variability, so the highs and lows from one year to the next. So in terms of developing uh, a curve for these ecological functions, uh, the, the technical working groups who are modelers, first started with doing individual curves. If you were a muskrat, what does your perfect rule curve look like? And it doesn't look anything like what you might think a perfect rule curve would look like. But you do that for all of these different interests. 
we run them through the model, see how the things are performing. It's, it's clear that we're not going to adopt a perfect four muskrat uh, curve or a perfect four uh, fighting cattails, which is, involves massive changes in water levels. But it, again, it's, the, it's the, the fence post, like we did with the flooding plan, if you open the gates in January. It gives us a sense of uh, what we can do in terms of improving the ecology. We brought all those roll curves together and, and Jean built, kind of fused it into one curve that was the original sort of ecological curve that we we're looking at. And then kind of shaved that down to respect the flood and drought limits that the IJC has in place in terms of emergency levels. And then they went through the process here, this sort of general process of, is it worth pursuing further? Is it not worth pursuing further? So we have a couple of curves that were developed and were shown earlier today. The black lines, the top is Namakin, and the bottom is Rainy Lake. The black dashed lines are the 2000 row curves, and the blue lines are the, uh, for this particular ecologically focused or environmentally focused curve, this would be a curve that you would repeat year after year. It's not, a, it's not that interannual variability. And the results from this, uh, based on what I heard this morning, really excellent for walleye. Uh, just much better walleye spawning uh, opportunities on both lakes. Okay for muskrats, which are included in there on uh, Rainy Lake. There's clearly an increased flooding risk because you're raising the lakes right before the main flood part of the year. And uh, the, you also have much lower levels uh, possible because the, the roll curve bands are so much wider here. And there's a lot of discussion this morning among people from the area that those low levels are a real concern. And uh, so this particular roll curve is not one that we as a study board kind of thought we can move ahead on the way it is because those trade-offs were just too uh, strong. Looking at the interannual curves, this is a bit different. You actually have three different curves and you would, the idea being that you would choose one each year that you, would be your main target. So this year we're going to be low, next year we're going to be high. So every, I don't know, is, what is it, John, three or five years, you get some highs, some lows, some mediums, and you, you reflect more of a natural system. Again, the trade-offs here, given uh, how different they are from the 2000 World Curves, there's a lot of concern we heard from folks here this morning, and we're not, the study board isn't willing to go ahead and recommend these in the form that they are uh, right now because of those trade-offs. But we, I should mention, as John pointed out this morning, the benefits from this in terms of broad ecological things that also will improve uh, you know, economic things given how important the fisheries are in this basin are, are uh, significant. I don't know if John wants to further comment on that. Okay. So given that those uh, curves, you know, we love the ecological benefit, but we just can't handle the, the trade-offs there, uh, they came up with a, a compromise curve. So this kind of fuses together the flood reduction curve we were looking at earlier, and specifically looks at trying to help muskrats survive the winter. So, uh, oops, sorry. What that involves is having less drawdown over the winter. So you, you actually start the drawdown a bit earlier before things freeze up, so the muskrats build at a lower elevation, and you don't tend to come down as far uh, into March. So the, you just get less drawdown over the winter and they have a better chance of surviving because the water levels can uh, provide some protection. Again, we heard some concerns about uh, this approach and some of the, the target levels that we're looking at here. So. Uh, but basically it boiled down to this, the 2000 wheel curves and the flood reduction curves are the ones we were really looking at by the end of our, our workshop this morning. So this table does compare those three results. Uh, this is for uh, Rainy Lake. The first column is 2000 wheel curves. Again, blue is better, red is worse. Uh, the second column is the flood reduction curve. And the third is that uh, compromise curve that tries to benefit both flooding and muskrat. And I know you can't see the numbers here, but at the top, this is flood reduction, and both curves provide pretty much the same in the 2015, uh, sorry, 1950 and the 2014 flood in terms of flood protection. The uh, muskrat curve actually not so great for Northern Pike, and uh, both curves have some issues on Rainy Lake with uh, walleye but the flood protection is good, and then muskrat, under the muskrat curve, actually don't do too badly. On Namakin Lake, 
there's very little change in the flood uh, amounts because we're not really changing much on, on Namigan uh, in terms of the spring uh, refill period, but the overwinter period for Muskrat, again, we're trying to reduce that drawdown and they get a, a little bit of a benefit there, but nothing much changes from uh, either the 2000 rule curves or the, the flood reduction curve. So to pull it all together from what came out of the workshop today, and I should mention this was our draft decision workshop, so we're really trying to zero in on what we're going to be recommending here. And there seemed to be the most support for this idea of a flood reduction curve, but there was some uh, disagreement about whether it was worth pursuing given uh, some of the uncertainties about the effect on walleye in particular on Rainy Lake. So we're going to have to dig deeper to, to better understand what the uh, implications are for walleye there. Uh, the compromise curve had some greater concerns, but the study board I don't think has abandoned it. We've left the door open for our, our technical working group to try to uh, work with that, to come up with a plan that doesn't have too many trade-offs and can still uh, benefit the muskrat and flooding. And the study board also indicated a few of the members here today that we're not only looking to make changes to the rule curves that might improve things, but also looking to make changes in how the dams are operated and how the Water Levels Committee uh, is involved with telling the, the dam operators to make changes throughout the year and what kind of flexibilities might be involved to improve everything from flood reduction to better wild rice harvest to possibly muskrat. So that, but that's management within whatever curve we come up with. It doesn't necessarily need a, a shift in the curve. There's enough room often to just change whether you're targeting the bottom end or the top end at a particular time of year to help something. So the, the next few slides talk about these types of non-rule curve recommendations that we're looking at making. Uh, so this first one that I was discussing, we're calling operational considerations or operational guidelines. And these are, again, benefits that we can do just by changing where you're targeting within the band at a given uh, point in the year. And it's not something that you would do every year, but you would uh, do as conditions allowed and as a particular interest uh, you know, might benefit from that. So you can take the example of uh, wild rice. You're not going to have a great wild rice crop every year. But if you get to the middle of June and you find, you know, we're getting reports back from the watershed, crops looking great this year, you know, a decision could be made to target the lower part of the band through the rest of the summer where the wild rice really does well when the lake levels are a bit lower. You get better beaches around the lake. You know, we had that 2015 was a year like that. We had really good conditions, but you're, you're still within the band. You don't need to change the rule curves to do that. It's just an operational decision. So that's one example, and we're putting together, basically based on the science and the studies that have come out of, the, out of this, a, a set of guidelines that the Water Levels Committee can use that would be on the website that anyone can look at that would give essentially advice for how you operate if you want to help a certain interest if the conditions allow. So this would not be a fixed rule, you have to do it every time. It would still be up to the committee to make uh, decisions and you know weigh the risks of uh, high flows and low flows and whatnot. But I think there are some real benefits that could happen there. The second aspect that's not a rule curve change but could still improve things is uh, greater involvement with the community. Uh, so yesterday, the Water Levels Committee uh, met here at the college with uh, some representatives of different groups around the basin, agency advisors, the Property Owners Association, uh, Treaty 3, and some others. And basically, just to sit down, let's discuss what conditions are like this spring and get feedback from the people in the community about what their concerns are, what they're seeing when they're out in the bush. Uh, so the Water Levels Committee is better informed for making its decisions heading into the spring and uh, hopefully you know, the word gets out from the community members to their broader community about what the Water Levels Committee is thinking, and it's just better communication clearly improves things, but I think it could improve the result as well uh, just by getting uh, better information. So we're looking at making recommendations of having a more formal meeting like that every year and coming up with some real uh, formal participants and everyone would send their representative, and that representative would have a, a job of reporting not just to the Water Levels Committee, but reporting back to their, you know, the sports fishing club or whatever the case may be. And the third sort of non rule curve option that builds on, on the first, but it's a, this concept called adaptive management, and it's used in, a, in some other watersheds that the IJC is involved with. So this study, we've had a lot of science that has gone into this over the last 10 uh, years or more. 
and a lot of models have been built that are, are really excellent and uh, you know they've been reviewed and are could be useful tools going forward. There's still a lot of questions about you know can we really help muskrat if we adjust those water levels? There's some confidence there, but there's some uncertainty as well. So if you wanted to go ahead with say a muskrat plan, we should be following up to see is it actually working? Is it worth you know, adjusting those levels at the end of the summer and into the winter. So an adaptive management approach is a, a more comprehensive approach where you're collecting data uh, year after year, you're working with the agencies in the basin to answer some of these questions, and then you change your approach within the existing rule curve based on the data and the science that you're getting back. There could be new science. You could have climate change, uh, you know, really showing up more forcefully here in the basin and wanting to make uh, changes that way. So I'm not going to offer any details of this because we haven't really formulated that, but it's a, a much more comprehensive approach to, uh, rather than waiting 15 years and seeing how things have gone, uh, changing things not on the fly, but you know more frequently and not major changes, but making uh, small adaptations as you go along that are supported by, uh, by the data and the science. Um, Anything I'm missing there in terms of adaptive management? So just some examples there of adaptive management. So that in a nutshell is where we are with the study. And just this is the last slide. So we have our draft report. We'll be going out on our website and sent out to our, our email lists uh, early in April. There'll be a 30-day formal co public comment period. So the comments will come back. You can submit them online or email them to our uh, study director. Uh, in early May, we'll have our final decision workshop, so we had the draft decision workshop this morning. This will really be more of uh, presenting to our public advisory group and our resource advisors where we landed in terms of our final recommendations. We will have revisited our draft report based on the comments we received in the public comment period for our, our final draft, uh, which will go to an independent peer review group, so the IJC has hired you know, experts in the field to review our work before we actually submit it to the IJC to make sure it's sound science and the recommendations make sense. And in mid-June, we'll submit our final report to the IJC and hold a press conference uh, to kind of outline the main recommendations. And this summer, the, uh, the goal is that the, uh, the commission itself, the, the uh, commissioners, will come out and hold uh, formal public hearings so you can come and You'll have the report and you can make your comments to the commissioners themselves before they make any decisions on whether to accept the recommendations or, or change them.